Hello everyone, we're so thankful to have you tune in to Word of Life this weekend. Whether you're watching by Facebook or CBS, we are excited to have you with us. Now, two weeks ago, we started a new series on how to handle transition and trauma. Now, my wife did Mother's Day last weekend, and we just want to say a big God bless you to all of the amazing moms out there, and my wife crushed it. Uh, So I'm a little intimidated to come up behind her, but here we go. We're gonna have fun. Now, if you didn't hear part one of this message, you've gotta go back and listen to that. What we are doing with this collection of talks is we are creating a resource and a tool for you to use in this season or any season of life where you're going through transition and trauma. Now, it's a reality of life that each and every one of us will face the death of something. It could be the death of a friend or a family member. It could be the death of a job. And maybe some of you are wrestling with that in this season, like you've been unemployed and about 20% of our nation is coming close to wrestling with that transition. It could be the transition of having a child graduate high school and go to college. It could be the transition of going to college or leaving college trying to find a job in a job market like this. But all of us know what it's like to go through transition and drama. And this is a resource for me and for you to walk through those seasons and to see the best of God's plan come and be fulfilled in your life and in mine. So I wanna ask you to take this journey with me and the journey starts with message one in this series. And so I wanna encourage you to go back and listen to it if you have not already. Now, what we began talking about was something called Eastertide and they'll put it up on the screen. Eastertide is the season of life that we're actually in right now. And the reason why we call it Eastertide is the tide turned for the good on Easter. Now, this is what we want. I I think all of us can sense, like, no matter who we are in the world, our world is changing, and we're in the middle of not knowing what that change will be. Like, travel's going to change at the end of this. Eating at a restaurant is going to change at the end of this. I was in Walgreens yesterday, and there's plexiglass in front of every employee. Walgreens is changing. Like, There's all this change going on in the process of our nation and our world right now, and a lot of people are asking, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? Now, here's the hope we have in Jesus, that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so what Eastertide is teaching us is when the tide changes, how to make that change for the good. And I just want to honestly just prophesy this over your life, that no matter how dark it looks right now, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and we believe the tide is changing for the good. Now, Easter tide went through a cycle of events, and those five events are listed on the screen. You have Good Friday, the, di- the day our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died. You have Easter Sunday, the day he was risen in a better form than he was before his death. Then you have number three, the 40 days. Uh, Jesus walked with his disciples for 40 days until he was number four, ascended, where God, the heavens opened and God lifted him up and that kind of moment where he looks down and blesses his disciples, the ascension. And then number five, the coming of the spirit, which we see in the book of Acts. You remember Jesus told the disciples, don't do anything until you've been endued with power from on high. And we said that each one of these events signifies us something in our life that will teach us how to turn the tide of transition and trauma, not just close the chapter on the past, but make the future better than it's ever been before. And this is exactly what I want for you. I want your future to be better than your past. And so let's talk about each one of these events and how they handle transition and drama, no matter what that transition may be. Uh, The first point, name your deaths. This is Good Friday. And this is where we come to a place in our lives, and I just want you to understand this, where we understand that something has died. 
Um, a couple of um, months ago, now, wow, time is flying. I had some work done in my backyard and we were digging out kind of like uh, some underground things to kind of take rainwater that was pooling because we've had so much rain uh, that my yard was getting flooded. So we were looking at, at kind of taking that water somewhere else. And as we were doing that work, the guy who was helping us with that, he said, you need to watch this tree for signs of death that there has been trauma around it and it could equal like the root system being damaged and you need to watch for signs of death because trees can die, plants can die. Uh, our plants die all the time at the Sims household because I'm responsible for watering them and unfortunately I do a bad job. So we know like trees can die, plants can die, but a season of life can die. Like your season in a certain city can die. There are friendships that you had in 12th grade that you don't have any longer. Like there are jobs that at one time were so vibrant and so great you can just sense, like you can kind of see the death. Now this is not God's best and this is not God's will that things die. And this is why when we get to heaven, he'll wipe away every tear from our eye and we'll no longer cry tears over death because death will be eradicated. But as long as we're on this earth, we will face the death of things. And with phase one or step one, what we're doing is we're naming that death and we're saying it has died. Now, this is not like a um, sadness stage where it's like, go so deep into your emotions until you get depressed. This is an acceptance stage where we understand this season of my life is over and it's time for me to move on. And we come into a place of acceptance and we said that acceptance is not passivity. Acceptance is just acknowledging that I have to move from this place. Remember, we, we looked at this passage of scripture where God comes to Samuel and he's mourning over a past season where he was in this relationship, a father type relationship with a man by the name of Saul. And he's just mourning over the loss of what happened with Saul. And you remember God came to him and he said, how long will you mourn over Saul? Now, I love that question because he didn't say, why are you mourning over Saul? Because we understand like it's okay and God understands it's okay to be sad if a loved one passes away. It's okay to be sad if you can sense a job is dying. It's okay to be sad if you had a business falter or fell. What God was doing in Samuel's life is he's saying, how long will you allow this event to define you? It's time for you to move on. It's time for you to understand. Joshua, Moses is dead. Like it's time to move from this place. And what we're accomplishing with acceptance is we're building a new foundation for us to build a new life on because like we said last week, and number two, we have to see our births that it didn't end with Good Friday. How many of you know the story of Jesus didn't end with, and they buried him? No, it ended with they buried him and he rose again. Now here's what we said in God, that while death was never God's idea, like in the Garden of Eden, the lion was laying down with the lamb and later when Jesus comes and changes the world and we're all with him in glory, the lion will lay down with the lamb again, there will be no death. But when death came into the world, God knew until he comes and gets us, death will be there. But God did something amazing. He said, when something dies, I will have it come out of the ground better than when it went in. So you take a seed and you plant it and it dies. When it dies, it doesn't come forth as another seed. It comes out as something much more powerful than what went in. And man, I felt that, that point so strong in my heart two weeks ago. Like that was so big in me that you have to understand that in God, if something dies, it's only because there's something better that's going to come out of it. And if you've had something in your life die, I promise you, your past is not your best season. God has something even better for you. And if we learn to like lift up our eyes from the place where we are and see what God has for us, 
And we're willing to come and just accept that and move on, but say, you know what? I'm gonna dream a new dream. You know what? I'm gonna pray some bigger prayers than I've ever prayed before. Like, I understand this is over, but I'm going to major on what I have right now, and I'm gonna get in faith like I've never been in faith before. Uh, Today, I had this moment where I was with my grandmother, And she is 87 years of age, and we spent this time just honoring her and being with her. And when I'm with her, I'm just talking, and we're sharing life and all of those kinds of things. And I realize this, this woman that is in front of me at 87 years of age is vibrant, full of health, has an amazing sense of humor, is not on any medication, Like she is just the epitome of health, spirit, soul, and body at 87. And that sounds great. And I want to be there when I'm 87. Like I I joke with her all the time. I'm like, I really want to be you when I grow up. Like seriously, I want to be you when I grow up. But I realized that this woman who was standing strong, spirit, body, and soul, where so many people today are struggling with mental health, like their soul is unhealthy is not a woman whose life has been void of trauma and transition. In fact, this lady has been through more trauma and transition than anybody else I know. Her husband passed away. She had two sons. Both of them passed away. I could list Drama after drama and transition after transition that has happened in her life. And I'm sitting at this woman and I'm, I, I'm going through. My daughter asked, because we took the kids over. My daughter asked, do you have any old photos of when you went to high school? And I'm looking through all of these old photos and I'm seeing all the different places she has lived and all the things she's experienced over the course of 60 years and, and I'm looking at pictures of my father and my uncle, and I'm, I'm like really gravitating towards the loss that this woman has faced in her life. Like, and I'm seeing, I'm like, how is she this happy? Like, how is she this strong? And how, when I see her, like, how is she able to maintain this kind of vibrancy? And I just started poking and prodding for answers on that because... I want that. What is life if you don't have joy? I I, I ask this with just an incredible amount of sincerity. Like I know everyone wants like possessions and stuff or fame or any of these types of things, but what is life if you don't have joy? And this woman is just filled with joy at 87 in spite of all the terrible things that has happened in in her life. And I'm, I'm poking and prodding, looking for an answer as to why. And I get in my car and I'm just processing all the conversations that we had. And I could not help but to think about the woman in 2 Kings chapter 4. And here's a woman whose husband has died and apparently he racked up some serious debt before he died and had no life insurance. So when he dies, he's left his family with a debt. And this woman has two sons and she cannot work to pay off the debt. So the creditor is coming to enslave her sons until they work off the debt. And these are young boys. She does not want that to happen to them. So you can imagine now, like we, we hear Bible stories like this like all the time. But place yourself in her shoes. Like, I have two children. Can you imagine one? Like, I I certainly don't even want to go there in my imagination. But if my wife passed away, like, how that would just rock my world. And not only that, I have people coming to take away my kids now. Like, how emotional you must be. So she goes to the prophet And he's a representation of God and the earth. So it'd be like the equivalent of you going to God in prayer. And she's incredibly emotional. And who can blame her? Like, right? Like, I can't blame her. I mean, right? Like, she's incredibly emotional. And she goes to the prophet and she's weeping before him. And she's like telling him the story I just told you. And he asked her a question, which I think is incredibly prevalent. He said, what is in your house? She's like, excuse me? He's like, what do you have in your house? And here's what, this was her response. I have nothing. Because she's at this season where 
she is only seeing her deaths. I have nothing, she says. There's nothing I have in my house, which we know is not true. She still has boys there. They haven't been taken away yet. She still has a house, right? Because if he has to ask the question, what do you have in her house? Means that she still has a house. She has something. And he pokes a little bit more. What do you have in your house? And she said, all I have is a jar. And it's got a little bit of oil. And you know what the prophet said to her? Why don't you go go and borrow a couple of vessels and why don't you pour out what you have? Why don't you use what you have? And I look at my, my grandmother who the first major transition, well, I shouldn't say the first major transition, the first like greatest, biggest transition that happened in her life was when my father passed away. Her youngest son without her getting a chance to say goodbye. Like, how did you, how did you make it in that season? She found what was in her house and she poured out her life into what she had. That time she had a husband and another son and a church and she poured herself out in that church and she poured herself out in that son and she poured herself out in that husband and it filled her up with joy and life became solid again. Then her husband died. And it would be so easy for her to fall into this place of, I don't have my husband, I don't have my youngest son, I have nothing in my house. And God would come and say, what do you have in your house? I still have my son. I still have my church. And she poured herself out into making those things as great as possible. Then that son passed away. Then her time in that church passed away. And here she is at 87. You know what she does? Every single service at 10 o'clock, she drives all the way from Clinton, Mississippi, all the way here to Flowood to come to church with us every single week. You know what she does after that? She doesn't cut to the back because she's elderly and needs some time to sit down. She stands at the altar praying and talking to anyone who comes down for her for prayer, wisdom, or counsel. You know what she does? She calls my wife. You know what she does? She calls my kids. You know what she does? She texts me and she pours out confirmation. She pours out encouragement. She pours out life. And you know what she has today at 87 years old in a house every day where she is alone? You know what she has in that house? I'll tell you what she has. She not only has a jar with a little bit of oil. Let me tell you what she has. She has joy This 87-year-old woman has joy because she understands there's always something I can pour into. That instead, instead of majoring on what I don't have, let me see what I do have and let me celebrate it. Let me pray for it. Let me major on it. Let me worship over it. Let me invest myself. Let me encourage somebody today. Let me pour out myself to somebody today. Let me pray for somebody today. Let me bake a cookie for, we left her house. You know what she did? She gave us chicken. I don't even know why she gave us chicken. It was like a whole bag filled of frozen chicken. I'm like, why is she giving us chicken? Like, what are you, because she's pouring herself out. And here's the thing, if I, she, no one would blame her for sitting in that house depressed every single day of her life. But she has joy because she has found like life is not just filled with death, but life is filled with new births and new opportunities and new things to get excited about and new things to worship over and new things to pray over and new things to praise over. What do you have in your house? Some of you have kids right now you can pour into. Some of you have jobs right now you can pour into. Some of you have like a church right now you can pour into. But whatever you have in your house, if you begin to see your births and pour out your life into those things, you'll see not only begin, God begin to change the chapter and to introduce what I believe is going to be the greatest chapter of your life but you'll begin to see God help you accept the death of the things that are behind you 
And instead of it being quicksand that is sucking you down so slowly, it is a firm foundation that now you can build off of. Which brings us to point number three, adjust to your new normal, the ascension. Now, this is interesting to me. Of Here, Jesus, he steps on the scene. He's not just Jesus. He's better than ever before. And I believe that for you, it's the same way. Like this season of your life, I don't care what it looks like out there. I don't care. This season of your life, what we and you, this church, all of you looking at, where we're getting ready to walk into, it's going to be the best season any of us have ever had. Because wherever there is death, there always comes out a better beginning. And so I, I know it's going to be great. And Jesus steps out of this and he is better than ever before. But also life is different. They can't interact with him the same way. Like before Jesus never walked through a wall. <laughs> and now Jesus is like walking through walls and like all of these things. And before Jesus was like locked to a physical body and wherever he was, like you had to be there. Now you could call on his name and he can be right there. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he can show up in that midst. So He's better than ever before, but instead of just being like, hey guys, you know what? It's better than it's ever been before. Peace out. I'll see y'all in eternity. He's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hang out here for 40 days. I'm gonna walk with you. I'm gonna talk with you. I'm gonna eat with you. And I'm gonna teach you, this is important, a new routine. I'm gonna teach you how to do life with me. I'm going to teach you how to walk with me. I'm gonna teach you how to sit with me. I'm gonna teach you a new routine on how to interact with me in this season. Now, whenever we're coming off of the death of something, there is this, this time period where something that's called a spirit of heaviness can sit on us. Now, the, the Bible talks about this in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse three, and it says there is a spirit of heaviness. Now, here's what I've noticed through pastoring, and I've been pastor now for almost 18 years. And over the course of 18 years, I have seen a lot of people, sometimes temporarily, and other people for a long time have the spirit of heaviness that is on them. It's interesting to me, a lot of people talk about how like people are wrestling with the spirit of fear in this season. You know what I see people wrestling with more than a spirit of fear? It's a spirit of heaviness. Now, th this spirit of heaviness, it clouds you. This spirit of heaviness, uh, it, it makes you lose energy. It makes you lose life, punch bounce. Uh, this spirit of heaviness drags you. This spirit of heaviness weighs on you. This spirit of heaviness makes you stay up late because you can't sleep and wake up groggy. Like there's not a bounce to you. There's no punch to you. And the Bible says that there is a such a thing as a spirit of heaviness. Now, here's what I have found with this. It typically comes because of an event, like something happened at work and it stressed you out more so than normal. And maybe it was combined with something else that was also happening in another area of life. I sense this in my heart, like something happened at work and then an insecurity arose. And the combination of those two things equaled a spirit of heaviness. Like it was an event. For some of you, like maybe you did just lose your job. And like now a spirit of heaviness is kind of like just sat on you. Typically, the spirit of heaviness is caused by an event. Like something happened and now you feel different. In fact, one of the key signs of a spirit of heaviness is people asking you all the time, are you okay? Are, are you okay? Spirit of heaviness, it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's, and it's not just like a real thing, it's a biblical thing. And it typically happens because of an event, but here's what you need to know. It stays because of a routine. Events happen and then they are, they're over. But what this event does is typically it rocks our routine. We're on our phone more. We're listening to bad news more. We're not listening to worship music as much. It's been a minute or longer, like a long minute since you read your Bible. 
Like there's a routine that sets in and the spirit of heaviness weighs on you and weighs on you and weighs on you. Here's what happens when a spirit of heaviness sets. You know what people do? They begin to numb themselves. Somebody says, what do you mean? They begin to find relief from the pain that is not godly. And it could be through food, it could be through alcohol, uh, it could be through pornography, uh, it could be through something that is out there, and let's just get real in the church house today. But it's trying to numb to not feel the transition, to not feel the trauma, to not feel the death. It's like going back to the example of the tree in my yard, it's like, why is it turning brown? Oh, it's fine. I just won't look at it. We're like, why is all the bark falling off of it? It's fine. No big deal. So you can like walk by it and just try not to see it. And this is what numbing does. And so oftentimes why we numb is so that we don't feel the transition. Like we know something is dead. And we also know like, especially for us Christians that in God, like the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. And there are moments where we have hope and there are moments where we have faith, but we've got this routine that is equally a spirit of heaviness that is on our lives. And it happens to all of us. Now, most notably, the example that came to me when I was studying was King David. Uh, something in his life died. Now, the reason why this thing died, and this could be an important distinction, was not just because it passed away, it was a direct result of some of his actions. And there's two kinds of deaths that are in the earth. Like a, a godly death is something passes away in its time, like it was time for it to kind of pass away. You remember Ecclesiastes to everything, there's a time, there's a time for birth, there's a time for death. Like there's a time for it. And sometimes like you're just on a job and it's like out of nowhere, it's like, man, if I look around, the tree is brown. Like this thing is, it's dying. Like this is, this is just not for me. Like it's just not a fit for me any longer. And the grace for it is just it's passing away and you, you notice it like, and that's okay. Not everything has to be perfect. Like there can be times where it's just dying and don't get me wrong. Like don't quit your job right now. Like I'm not saying that. I'm saying like on the inside though, right? Like some of you knew long before it ever was over that it was over. Like there's just knowing because in God things do pass away. But then other times they don't just pass away we kill it. Like there's something there where it should still be alive, but because of something we said or something that we did, something died. And in David's life, it was the latter. And typically this hurt, uh, I guess hurt, hurts helps. It causes the spirit of heaviness to a greater degree than most other things because you feel responsible for something that happens. So it's compounded. And so in David's life, he's got a child that was born through an affair and he murdered the man that he had an affair with or, or he was with Bathsheba and she was married to a man and he killed that man so he could be with Bathsheba. And so here he's wrestling with that. Uh, but out of this, the, the Bathsheba had a child and the child died. And when this is going on in David's life, you see the spirit of heaviness just come on David. And you see the elders come to him and they're like, are you okay? Like, are you, are you okay? He's like, I don't wanna talk right now. You ever been there? I don't wanna talk about it. Don't ask me about it. I don't want anyone poking. I don't want anyone prodding. Why? Because I want to not feel it. I want to be numb. I don't want to adjust to a new normal. I don't want to find a new routine. I, I want the Jesus who was here before. Like, I, I, I'm uncertain at how to interact with you, Jesus. Jesus like, it's okay. That's why I'm going to be with you for 40 days in this form. But there's a new routine you're going to have to take on. There's a new thing you're going to have to learn to walk with. And in David's life, he doesn't want to feel this pain. He just wants to numb it. In David's life, he's like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to adjust to a new routine. I don't want to focus on living life after this. And they're like, David, but it's just time. And finally, we see David kind of snap out of it. And he breaks off 
of this spirit of heaviness and he adjusts to this new routine and finds his new normal. I wanna show you what he did. And as you're looking at your routine of like managing this transition of whatever you're walking through personally with COVID-19 or whatever you're walking through in this time, maybe for some of you who are unemployed, or maybe you're listening to this message two years from now and you're wrestling with a family member who passed away. It is going to be different. And this differentness, you've got to adjust to it and learn a new path and learn a new walk. Now I want to help you with that. I think David's life helps us clue in. Here was David's routine. It's found in 2 Samuel. They'll put it on the screens. Chapter 2 and verse 20. Number one, he arose. Before, he was just cast down all the time. Have you ever been lazy? I know I've been lazy before. But did you know that we need motion? That, that one of the things that I think breaks us free from depression is motion. See, I, I think exercise moves emotion from the soul over into the body where you can work it out. I wanna say that again. I think exercise moves emotion from the soul into the body where you can work it out. And motion just helps. So oftentimes when that spirit of heaviness is on us, we don't wanna move. And one of the most spiritual things you can do is literally walk with God. Not just figuratively walk with God, literally Walk with God. Go get in nature. Go take for a walk. Go take a walk. Take for a walk. Go take a walk. You try preaching when there's nobody in the room listening to you. Go, go take for a walk. We'll just stick with that. You know what I'm talking about. Go take a walk. Take out the earbuds. Listen to your heart. Breathe in the air. Motion helps with emotion. One of the things my 87-year-old grandmother does every day, you know what it is? Walk. Her sister, she called and asked her, she said, don't you, she, you, don't you know you shouldn't be walking like that? She said, what do you mean? She's like, I love this. She said, girl, if I tried to do that, I'd die. Here's what my grandmother said. If I don't do it, I'll die. And there's some truth to that. Like, any time that spirit of heaviness is on your life, it makes you want to sit, it makes you want to think, it makes you want to process, it makes you want to worry, it makes you want to get boxed in. And one of the greatest things you can do is say, no, I will not get in motion. Number two, David not only arose, he took care of himself. He hadn't been eating right. He hadn't been sleeping right. He hadn't been nourishing his body. He hadn't been taking care of himself. I want you to get in motion with your new routine. If it's a walk or the gym when they open or whatever it may be, like get in motion, begin to exercise. But number two, start taking care of yourself. Spirit, soul, and body begin to nourish yourself. For, for so long, David just kind of neglected himself. He was giving himself to things that were numbing, numbing him. Let me ask, have you been giving yourself to things that have been numbing you? He had been giving himself to things that were numbing him instead of giving himself to things that were making him come alive. And I wanna encourage you in this season, like give yourself to that. I, I wanna bring, bring out one important thing that I think all of us need to know right now, get off your phone. Stop looking at the news 24 seven. Did you know there is a company in America whose profits are up double? You know what it is? CNN. I kid you not. I read the article the other day. <laughs> I read the article about the article. No, listen, there's so much things out there that are profiting off fear. It's dangerous when you can monetize fear that are profiting off of just clicking you over into taking your soul in a deeper way. Now here's the two times I want you to guard. I want you to guard the time you go to bed, uh, the, the time right before you go to bed and the time after you wake up. Sleep restores your mind, literally. It's proven out, the science has proven out that your brain, literally, your brain regenerates with sleep. And one of the things that affects our sleep is what we put into it right before we go to bed. And did you know what? When you wake up in the morning, typically when you settle in in the day, if you can wake up at an early time and not just rush to work, 
you can wake up earlier, your brain is freshest there because after good sleep, it is regenerated. And that's one of the times where we can tune in and lock in on God. I wanna encourage you, take care of yourself. Point number three in this point, he came into the house of God and he found a place of worship. I wanna come back to that one. I'll end with that one. And we'll look at four. He places himself in community. You need people. One of the things my grandmother has and has always had is a network of people she can call. She's, I pay for my grandmother's cell, cell plan. Like I pay for it. Uh, so I pay for a data. I pr- pay for all those things. My grandmother out calls and out texts me and my wife by a factor of four. Like literally times four. I'm like, who in the world are you texting? Like, oh my gosh, like what in the world? Like, I'm like, she literally has four times the amount of texts going through her phone than I do. Like, and I'm like, that's all I do is talk to people through text. My grandmother is incredibly connected. And if you wanna break the spirit of heaviness off your life, did you know that a joy have have with someone is literally doubled? But when you have a pain in your life, but you bring someone else in, it is halved. And I wanna encourage you, like you need community, you need friends, you need people you can text and call and process things with. David began to connect with those people again. But point number three, and I just wanna end with this analogy is, David began to come into the house of God. He began to bring God closer to him. Do you know God's never moved? Like people say, if you feel far away from God, like you can feel far away from God, but do you know God never moved? In the story of the prodigal son, he was always at the house. It was the son who moved. And when that spirit of heaviness is on us, it's been a long time since we picked up this. It's probably been a long time since we we took this and just really, really opened it up and said, Holy Spirit, I need you to speak to me today. Like it's been a minute and and, and probably the absence of meeting physically in church is that you haven't done even that part of your spiritual walk. I wanna encourage you, open up scripture. Look at 2 Kings chapter four and look how that woman found what was in her house. Open up 2 Samuel here and start looking at what, what, what is going on here in the life of David. Like, open up the word of God, dive into those things. I wanna encourage you, like, bring God in on your life. I, I, I thought of this example and I, I saw someone else do it, so I'm totally stealing it. But so oftentimes we have all of these problems. We have addiction and it just fills us with shame. We have an anxiety. We have things going on in our marriage. We have, some of you really have some things going on with finances. Although I've talked to some people and they're like, I'll take the, the, the bonus check. Like I'll take the free check that the government's handing out. So maybe you're, you, maybe you're doing great financially, uh, but some of you are really going through it financially and then others of you have things with family. And what the spirit of heaviness does is here you have God. It wants to take God completely out of the equation. So we've taken God and he's nowhere near our problem. And we're sitting here next to these things and all we're doing is looking at it and looking at it and looking at it. And then maybe occasionally we'll pick up the Bible or maybe occasionally like we'll, we'll, we'll go and like pray a little bit and you know, it's meal time so we might as well pray and it's like, Lord, help this family in some shape, form or fashion in Jesus' name, amen. But you know what David did? He said, you know what? I need God, I want you to get this. I need God as close to me and my problem as possible. Like I need God as close to me and my problem as possible. And here's what I want you to do in this season. I want you to pick up God. I want you to literally carry God, carry God before your eyes with scripture. What are you listening to it in your car? Put on some worship, put on some praise. Like what do you wake up to? Don't wake up to the phone and look at all of those news stories. Wake up and believe the report of the Lord by getting in your scripture. Listen to preaching. Take notes on what you're listening to. Take God and get him as close to your problem because here's here's what happens. When I take God and I get God close to my problems, it's like, ah, it's still not moving. So I get him a little closer. It's like, ah, still not moving. So I get him a little closer. Ah, it's still not moving, but I get him all the way as close as possible. It's like, oh man, all of my problems. Come on, somebody. All of my problems, God begins to help me 
with all of those things that affect me. And here's what would just be a shame to me. If you came out of this unaffected by all that is going on in our nation, somebody says, that would bother you? Absolutely would bother me if you came out of this unaffected. I want you to steward all this. I, I want you to absolutely make this not, listen to me, whatever you're going through, make this refine you and not define you. David, and this is my final note, I really am closing. David stewarded his pain well. Oh, I want you to get that. Oh, I could just preach on that. What do you do with your pain? How are you stewarding your pain? Like, like David had this pain that he had lost control of for a moment and he's getting heavier and heavier. But he finally made a decision to take his pain and steward it well. And I wanna ask you, what are you doing with your pain in this season? Whether you're listening to this right now or 10 years from now, what are you doing with this pain? What are you doing in this moment? David began to steward his pain well and he made that pain make him dive closer into God, closer into community, closer into better health, closer into more movement. And as David began to steward that pain well, here's what happened. That pain did not define him. That pain refined him and he came out of that better than he went into it. And I wanna let you know, my grandmother is not defined by her husband passing away. And she is not defined by, well, you know, of course she's sad. She had both sons pass away as well. She did not let those events define her. She allowed those events to refine her and she's filled with joy, forgiveness, peace and life, knowing that her family is not just a part of her past, but her family is a part of her future because there is hope in Jesus. And so she might as well live and occupy until they come. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this moment and this season of your life, and I don't want to allow it to define you. I want you to come out of this refined. And you know how you're going to do it? By taking the time to get a better routine in this season than ever before. I wanna encourage you, bring God in. Maybe some of you are watching this and you've kind of left God on the sidelines. I feel this big in my heart. You've kind of let, left God on the sidelines. And some of you, you've walked with God for a long time, but this event, instead of making this e event evolve you and like become this better person, it has devolved you. And you have found some bad habits creep in. You've, maybe some of you, you found your life ensnared by some of the things that you were ensnared by 10 years ago. And instead of evolving, you're devolving. Today it stops in the name of Jesus. You know how it stops? You bring God closer to your problem than ever before. Today, if you're watching this, I want you to right now to just ask God to come into your life. In fact, let's pray together. Close your eyes, wherever you're at, close your eyes. Even if you're watching on CBS, close your eyes. And let me pray for you. In fact, just pray this prayer after me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I receive your mercy. I receive your grace and I ask you, Father, would you help me come out of this season, come out of this moment, refined and made better? I give you my life, I give you my time. Today, Father, I give you myself, Jesus, you are my Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna encourage you if you prayed that prayer and you want help in following Jesus, go to our website at thelife.cc. Go on it, look through it, and find the place where it says following Jesus. Click that button, and when you click it, you can tell us you made a decision for Jesus, and we're gonna send you a book and a t-shirt just to let you know we love you, we're gonna call you, and we're gonna help you follow Jesus even in this time. 
And we wanna end this service this weekend with a song where we just allow the Lord to purify our hearts and minds. Let's draw near to him as a church family. I love you so much, Word of Life. And I can't wait to see you in person sometime real soon.